Hello, I'm Keith Ford. And I'm Steve Ostrom. And today we're going to bring you a trio of guns from the vault. And do you want to start with the introductions on your side? Uh, what are we looking at there? Okay, starting off, we've got the one that really got it started was the Elmer Keese 3844. That was sent to him by Douglas Wesson of Smith & Wesson. This is way back. Yeah, 1933. Yeah. And then right here we have Doug Wesson's personal 357 Magnum. And, and here we have Phil Sharp's. And Phil Sharp was instrumental in developing the 357, which came out in 1934, I believe. So these guns were used in the development of the first Magnum cartridge, basically, and started the Magnum era. So here's some real history here. Now you'll notice that uh, the two actual Magnums have long barrels uh, to kind of optimize performance, I guess, with the powders mm -hmm. they had back then. Elmer was able to crank, uh, crank out plenty of velocity with uh, 38 Special Brass in his heavy frame Smith there. Yeah, probably uh, not exactly to Sammy Specs, but <laughs> <laughs> the gun held together, took it in stride, no problem. It would be like a plus P plus load, I think, but you're dealing with an end frame with plenty of metal. So, uh, you know, nobody really had a problem with it. Right. The later guns were heat treated cylinders, you know, a little differently and they're stronger. Sure, the safety margin is much greater. But the fact that these guns have been around at the very beginning of the Magnum era, that is really something. So what's unique about this piece here that uh, belonged to Wesson himself? Okay, this was Douglas Wesson's 357. This pretty much evolved from the 3844. Now this is a pre-registered Magnum. This is a serial number that began with zero and was considered a club series gun. These were only uh, given to Smith & Wesson employees, uh, some select individuals and whatever. And Wesson used this on several big game hunts and he believed in the 357 Magnum cartridge so much that he hounded Remington Arms about getting a cartridge for the 357 they pretty much blew him off and said you know what and, you know nobody's really interested in that they kind of pulled an ibm nobody wants a com personal computer thing uh -huh. <laughs> and, but winchester actually jumped up on that and they ran with it and wesson believed in that and he did a demo with this actual piece of considered bulletproof glass at the time and Not shot so this yep this is a inch and an eighth thick piece of bulletproof glass and he just obliterated it with this 357 Magnum right here. So that caught the attention of several law enforcement folks, FBI and, and a lot of folks along the way and hunters and stuff and so they refined this and then went into the registered Magnum which is right over there by you. Now this this goes right along with the development of the 38 Super earlier, mm -hmm. where they wanted more velocity to penetrate, like bulletproof vests and yeah. stuff in the gangster era, and those heavy gauge car doors, stuff like yep. that. So more power was uh, was needed. Yes, they were. It was. And then whenever uh, Smith & Wesson started producing the registered Magnum, the gun was available in a length of from three and a half inches to eight and three quarters long. So you could get that in just about any length as long as it was in between those parameters right there. You could get different sights, you could get the trigger pull set at whatever you wanted. They were totally complete custom guns. And in the run of that, there was about 6,000 made. Now this belonged to a writer and a avid shooter, Phil Sharp. And Sharp come up with pretty much the book on loading the 357 Magnum at the time. And he did it with this gun right here. And he took exceptionally well good shape of this gun. It is. And it's got the old style sight that's blended with the top mm -hmm. strap with the two screw elevation. Yes. And then it's checkered, but it has that old style sight just like the outdoorsman mm -hmm. had, like that, the 3844. That's that's kind of a transition piece there. That's yeah. really something. And at the time, those guns were selling for about sixty dollars a piece, and that was in the height of the depression, and that oh. was a lot of money, a lot of money. But a lot of those went to uh, FBI people. There's, I believe it. Yep. And serial number one went to J. Edgar Hoover. This one is serial number two, and it's the. Uh, 
classic eight and three quarter inch barrel. It has a little grip piece in here, as you can see. Oh yeah, the kinda, insert here. Yep, insert right there. And the register magnum, whenever you bought the gun, you'd have a little card that you'd fill out and send it in to Smith and Wesson and they would register that in their books and knew exactly who every one of these guns went to. So it was fairly easy to track those down. And then about the time the war started and they stopped production and then they went on to what was called the 357 Magnum or the pre-27. And then around 1957 is whenever they went over to the model numbers and that became the Model 27. Right. So you're looking at the development and progress of the Model 27 Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum right here. And to have all three of these that really got the whole 357 Magnum going is, is pretty cool. Just to see the history and know the people that owned these were dedicated to getting this cartridge going. Now these 3844s, these outdoorsmen, they'd been around for a while before that. And mm -hmm. People had been hand loading them up yeah. and exchanging, swapping loads and all that. That 44 frame was around for a while, just as a 44 and a 45. Yeah. This is the same frame that a 1917 Smith and 45 ACP would have been going to World War I. But this is just highly polished and mm -hmm. just hand finished to within an inch of its life. I mean, all three of these revolvers are just beautiful. Now, this gun right here, Elmer Keith's, he specified in a letter, uh, there were several correspondences between him and Doug Wesson about this front sight, which was a crossbar front sight. And then the grips on here, uh, tell me about those, Steve. Those are number five. Those are uh, number five, uh, what, Roper grips? Yeah, Ropers. And, you know, the way they flare out at the bottom and come in behind the trigger guard, that's not that much unlike the Keith number five single action grips. This line here and then right in here with the real wide base, that is what he liked. I don't know if he had giant hands or small hands or what, but this is what he really liked to feel in a revolver and obviously it worked. He could shoot at long range with the best of them. He also had this uh, reflector, this little mirror in the front sight to shine light up on the bead to make it more visible in the daytime. Pretty slick little rig here. Just a total, total Cadillac of a, of a revolver. Everything on it's polished, nicely fitted, tight, and with 357 Magnum type loads, you could shoot it all day long and not worry about wearing it out. Mm -hmm. just, just amazing seeing all this right here together and how the progression of it and where it's ended up at. We've been very fortunate to get to look at these and we'd like to thank Rock Island Auction House for having us out and giving us the opportunity. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time when we bring you another gun from, from the, the vault. vault.